The year is 1969, a year of psychedelia, groovy cartoons, Sesame Street, The Haunted Mansion, Rock Stars, Woodstock, The Moon Landing, and Ford has once again offered its stylish Ford Fairlane Fastback body style to the buying public. In the 1968 and 1969 model years, the intermediate Ford line consisted of lower trim Fairlanes and its sub-series, the upper trim Torino models. The sixth generation Ford Fairlane Fastback models for 1969 started with the bargain basement Ford Fairlane 500 Fastback. The 500 offered attractive chrome side trim along the belt line as well as between the wheel arches. A smooth, flat panel was seen gracing the back between the taillights. Engines for 1969 included the 250 cubic inch Fairlane inline 6, 302 cubic inch Windsor V8, 351 cubic inch Windsor V8, 390 cubic inch Thunderbird V8, and the 428 cubic inch V8. The Ford Fairlane Cobra was introduced in 1969 as a competitor for Plymouth's Roadrunner. The Cobras had a standard 428 cubic inch V8 rated at 335 brake horsepower, while options included ram air induction, bucket seats, hood scoop, clock, tachometer, power disc brakes, and 4.30 to 1 rear axle gearing. For 1968, Ford redesigned its intermediate Fairlane line and introduced a new premium subseries model, the Torino, named after the city of Turin, or Torino in Italian, considered the Italian Detroit. Just as the Ford LTD had been the upscale version of the Ford Galaxy, the Torino was initially an upscale variant of the intermediate size Ford Fairlane. The upscale trim included a chrome grille in the lower portion of the rear taillight panel and a sporty front grille. GT and GTA options were also available. The final version of the car is known as the Ford Torino Talladega, a muscle car that was produced by Ford only during the first few weeks of 1969. It was named for the Talladega Super Speedway, which opened the same year. The Talladega was a special, more aerodynamic version of the Torino produced specifically to make Ford even more competitive in NASCAR racing. It was sold to the public only because homalgamation rules required a certain minimum number of cars be produced and made available. This was 500 in 1969. To make the car more aerodynamic at high speeds, a sleeker front section was added. The Torino Talladega replaced the factory stock nose with one that extended the car's length by about 6 inches, with a flush mounted grille on a more aerodynamic front end. The close-fitting bumper was actually a rear bumper that had been cut, narrowed, V'd in the center, and filled on the ends to create a crude air dam, further improving the aerodynamics of the car at high speeds. The rocker panels of the Talladega were reshaped and rolled to allow Ford teams to run their racing cars about an inch closer to the ground while staying within NASCAR rules. This also greatly enhanced the top speed of the car by lowering its center of gravity and further reducing its wind resistance. Also unique to the Talladega was the presence of competition black hoods and rear tail panels on all production cars, as well as the only interior offered black vinyl and cloth with a front bench seat. AMT was the first model car manufacturer to offer a 125th scale multi-piece model kit of the 6th generation Ford Fairlane in 1968. It featured a factory stock build option and a drag racing option. The drag racing engine came with a power ram cross manifold intake, twin four barrel carbs and exhaust headers. The factory stock option included a standard air cleaner mounted on a Holley four-barrel carb. The car rolled on factory stock GT Rally wheels mounted on period-correct vinyl Goodyear Polyglass GT tires. Out back, the dragster version saw two-piece plastic Goodyear blue oval racing slicks mounted on chrome reverse wheels. Up front, Astromag wheels were mounted on vinyl Goodyear Polyglass tires and raised axle blocks. The interior featured a dashboard with the chrome center console top mounted in place with bucket seat options for the front and a bench seat in the rear. For a racing interior, three-piece racing bucket seats replaced the factory units while a roll bar and tachometer were added. 
The window glass was a solid casting that included windshield, side windows, and a rear window. The chassis screwed into the radiator support wall and the body featured the rear taillight panel as a molded on piece with taillight housings and a rear bumper being the only chrome parts back there. The drag racing body was the same as the factory stock version but you cut out a hole through the hood to let the power ram intake breathe. Over the years, AMT altered the model from its original release by changing the window glass from one solid shell to two pieces windshield and rear window, offering a Cobra Jet Ram Air air cleaner and hood scoop to its factory stock engine, offering a more Thunderbird looking dual carb and oval air cleaner or your choice of velocity stacks to its custom engine, and a special NASCAR inspired racing engine. Your choice of factory exhaust pipes or NASCAR exhaust dumps and rear brake cooling ducts were added to the parts list. Goodyear Blue Streak stock car special tires and deep dish wheels were added to the four corners of the NASCAR racer version. A radiator surge tank with upper radiator hose was also added to the factory stock engine. The entire interior bucket assembly was redesigned to include a new rear bench seat, two-piece bucket seats, and a dashboard with the center console fill panel removed. For the NASCAR version, a center console blank out part was created to cover the factory stock center console, while a new panel type dashboard was added along with a racing steering wheel, six piece roll cage, and a two piece racing bucket seat. The rear bumper assembly was re engineered to include the lower portion of the rear taillight panel. Some kits like the 2006 RC2 release include the smooth lower panel to build an accurate Fairlane 500. Cobra or Talladega, while some kits, like the 2002 RC2 and most recent 2022 Round 2 offering, include the A-Crate Torino grille. For the NASCAR option, AMT added the rear spoiler, rear bumper streamliner side fill panels, and taillight covers while adding headlight covers and a grille screen up front. Now we are going to look at two of these model kits side by side and note the differences. I will also reference pictures from the original 1968 version that I have found online and show you how some of these changes might be affecting the fit and finish of the current kits. For this video I will primarily focus on the 2002 edition which you can build as a Ford Fairlane Cobra. But I will also show parts from the 2006 edition that includes a Ford Torino rear bumper and a slightly different chassis. This chassis has been known to have alignment issues that affect the wheelbase but in this video I will be using tips from our online community and YouTube audience to clearly show you how to correct this issue easily and quickly. Now let's look at the parts. First off we have the body. Seam lines run from the front of the fenders up the roof pillars, above the C-pillar vents, then drop behind the vents and run across the top of the rear fenders and drop to the back. These lines and any flash along the bottom must be removed for a smooth finish. In the side window openings we have these thick portions that were put in place to prevent the front window pillars from warping in the mold process. We need to remove these and file the attachment points flat to make the kit look like the real car. Along the lower portion of the windshield we see two windshield wipers and a vented cowl. One thing that is missing here are the fender panel lines to separate the cowl from the fenders. These are easily scribed in using the back of your number 16 hobby blade and some masking tape. I'll show you how to do this in the build step of this video. The body includes a detailed engine compartment with accurate shock towers, fender aprons, an elongated windshield washer bag that Pete suggested would need the bottom portion removed and some evergreen styrene card put in to fill the hole underneath. The radiator is small just like on the real car and the radiator support has two tubes molded to either side. These tubes were originally on the 1968 edition to screw the body to the chassis. Later, the screw holes on the chassis were filled and replaced with plastic pins. One thing I noticed on the post-1968 kits is that the tubes extend below the radiator support wall. Here is a picture of the front and side of the 1968 model to show the difference. I 
I believe the tube extensions were put there in the 1969 kit, but I can't find confirmation of this. I believe the extended tubes would drop into a countersunk hole on the chassis plate. I also believe that those holes were later sealed up, but the extended tubes remained. We now interrupt this theory with a more credible theory. The long mounting posts and extended NASCAR wheelbacks might be holdovers from the 1971 edition modified Stalker Cobra kit shown here. Racing the posts would allow clearance for the racing slicks and the extended NASCAR wheelbacks give the car the modified Stalker wide track suspension. This would explain why the wheel height seems too high in the front on later editions and why there is a gap between the chassis pan and the lower fender aprons. In the building stage of this video, I will try to correct the height of these posts to make them even with the bottom of the radiator support wall. At the rear of the car, you can see the upper portion of the taillight panel, the Cobra logo, and Ford letters on the trunk lid. This is perfect if your kit includes the rear bumper with the smooth lower panel. That means that you have the correct Cobra rear bumper. If your kit includes a Tornado rear bumper with a waffle pattern lower grille, you will have to remove all the Cobra emblems. According to Willy Was, the deck lid on the right hand side where the Cobra emblem is located is half a millimeter lower than the left side, so there will be a gap in the rear bumper part and deck lid in that spot. Looking at the inside of the body, you will notice some lines around the wheel arches. This is to radius the wheel arches to fit in the NASCAR tires. However, in my research, you only want to radius the front wheel arches as the rear tires were fitted into the factory stock wheel openings. We will talk more about how to fix the NASCAR wheel back lengths later. The lines around the rear wheel arches are carryovers from the 1968 Dragster edition and were designed to fit those huge drag slicks, a remnant of the past. There are some spots on the inside of the body that look like mold marks or some other strange items like long pins. Do not remove these as they are important to fitting other kit parts as we will see in the building stage of this video. If you are an advanced builder looking to add some missing details, you can also use the mold marks in the shock towers to your advantage. This is a great place to drill a shallow hole in the center of each mark and use a short length of evergreen styrene rod and a ballpoint pen spring to use as a shock absorber and coil spring. On the side of the body, you can see the Cobra emblems on the trailing edges of the front fenders. Again, if your kit has a Tornado rear bumper, you will have to remove these Cobra emblems. Mind you, if you want to use the new Cobra emblem decals from the new decal sheet on your older model with the Cobra rear bumper, you can also sand off the raised Cobra logos to allow the decals to lay down flat. Another thing to notice on the side of the body is the missing body panel lines. There should be a curved vertical line dropping down from the front door line to the bottom of the car. This is how the front fender attaches to the lower rocker panel on the real car. The second vertical missing body line is located just above the rear bumper notch out and continues into the trunk lid body lines. This is because on the real car, this back panel is basically a little complex curved L-shaped box that bolts to the back through the rear body panel. We will scribe in these lines in the building stage. Next we have the interior tub and you will notice these two little half moon tabs at the back. The driver's side tab is short and the passenger's side is long. They push into these two mold marks on the inside of the body. There are four mold marks on the inside carpet and back panel under the seat. There are also two holes on the floor for the NASCAR roll bar. Interior door panel detail is simple, but this was never a high option car. The floor also contains a center console and three floor pedals 
for a manual transmission equipped car. If you turn the interior tub upside down, you'll notice that the floor has what appears to be a melted weld look around the transmission tunnel and some small circular grinder marks. We will flatten these areas out with our sanding block in the building stage to help the interior sit flush with the chassis pan. Here we have the most controversial part of the entire model, the chassis. As you can see on the bottom surface, this is molded as a solid piece with all the suspension components, drive line and gas tank included. You will notice that the only thing not on here are the exhaust pipes. That is because the kit gives you an option of using the factory stock exhaust system or the NASCAR exhaust dumps and rear brake cooling ducts. Turning the chassis over to the top side, you can see a series of mold marks which will have to be removed with your number 16 hobby knife to allow everything to sit down flat. Another thing I notice is that this chassis has been spliced together by AMT. You can see it here on the transmission tunnel right at this point. It's actually skipped over to the driver's side by a millimeter and a half. You will also notice some plastic bars located just behind the splice. Boyd at Trekworks suggested removing the bars from the chassis top to make the interior fit to the floor and to bring the chassis pan and rocker panels closer to the interior bucket so that they sit down inside the body correctly so that you can't see them from the side of the model just like you can't see them from the side of the real car. You should be able to remove these bars with either a number 16 hobby blade or a number 18 chisel blade and some sandpaper. Where the transmission mounts to the chassis, you can see a mold mark on the top of this block arrangement. You will have to file this area flat to match the rest of the mounting block. Finally, at the front of the chassis, you will see one of two things depending on the type of chassis AMT gave you. The 2006 edition and the 2022 edition have long pegs that fit into the tubes located on the radiator support wall. These pins are set too far back, where that blue circle is, and cause the wheels to locate too far forward in the wheel arches. They will have to be removed and sanded flat so that you can align the front wheel blocks with the bottom of the shock towers. The 2002 edition, seen here, has these small cylinders molded ahead of the spot where the long pegs were on the 2006 and 2022 chassis pans. While these cylinders align the chassis better than the pins did, they are still a little bit away from where they should be. You could keep these cylinders on or file them off to move the chassis back if you think that fits better. Willy Was 6837 warns us to be careful not to push the chassis too far back because the rear bumper will not fit anymore. I notice this blade on the back of the chassis. Perhaps by removing it we can minimize the bumper push effect that Willy Was is talking about. Let's keep that in mind in the build stage of this video. Happy Grumpy adds that his AMT 1969 Ford Fairlane Cobra kit had a chassis that did not fit right. The wheels were not centered with the fenders. He had to move the chassis back by almost an eighth of an inch. The wheelbase was right, but the whole thing when put in the locator holes was way too far forward. He ended up by cutting the pins off and moved it back to the correct alignment. When looking at the side of the chassis, you will notice a sunken in area along the rear axle housing. It's shaped specifically like a box with an angled top. The rear axle hole is located inside this area, but some people have noticed that this hole is too far forward. Jimmy Erdman suggested an amazing fix for this problem, and we will look at his solution in the build section of this video. According to Willy Waz 6837, the hole for the left front wheel has a different height than the right, and the whole chassis is not really straight. I don't seem to have this issue with my chassis, but I have heard that the 2022 edition has more sink marks and flaws than the earlier releases. Hopefully mounting the chassis solidly to the body will take out the distortions of the 2022 kit. If you notice those front axle mounting holes, you will see a circular mold mark above them. In theory, if you drilled a hole in the center of these mold marks, you could run an axle between them and lower the front end of the car, provided the tires don't hit the top of the inner fenders. But this is just my theory, I haven't actually done it. The hood includes thin hood hinges and hood pins. The hood pins were a special feature for the Cobra and NASCAR, but if you have the Torino back end, you will have to file these hood pins and cables off to be accurate. 
If you look under the hood, you will actually see two indentation marks. The first one is this long oval, which is for the velocity stacks of the street machine engine to poke through. And this weird rectangular one is actually a remnant from the 1968 kit once again, poking up its head. And this was for its original air scoop. There are four mold marks, actually these are sink marks, in the corners of the hood along the cross brace under here. So you will have to fill those and sand them flat if you want to have a nice smooth beam underneath here. The hood has a nice tight fit when cleaned up and attached to the body. Here we have the parts tree that consists of our engine. So we have the right and left hand side engine block with the transmission and the oil pan molded on. We have our fan. We also have two intake manifolds on this parts tree, cylinder heads, radiator hose, fan belt and pulley, front timing chain cover, distributor. We've got our stock exhaust manifolds and headers. We also have a battery right here. And then here we have our wheel backs. I'll just turn that over so you can see. These are again the metal pin style as well as the plastic pin for the fronts. There are some mold marks on the bottom of these manifolds which will have to be sanded down in order to get them to sit on the top of the engine nice and easily. On this parts tree we can see the air cleaner for the NASCAR version as well as the exhaust pipes here and we have our exhaust dumps right there as well as the rear brake cooling ducts. We have the expansion tank for sitting on the top of the engine and our stock exhaust system. And over here we have as a bonus the front end for building the Talladega. However, we are missing the chrome bumper for this thing because it was a modified chrome bumper. This parts tree contains our NASCAR racing features. So here we have our two piece bucket seat. We also have these extensions to blank out the rear bumper. These are the streamlining pieces. Here we have the ends of the exhaust pipes for the stock version of the car. There's our NASCAR air spoiler in the back. We also have one of the NASCAR wheels and these components make up part of the roll cage. This parts tree continues our roll cage. This would be on the driver's side with all the padding and the extra bracing. And over here we have the passenger side, which of course there is no passenger in NASCAR. So this side is not as well protected. We also have one of the little crossbars for the roll cage. We have these window straps on here for the rear window. We also have another NASCAR wheel. We have this long tube thing right there. I'm not sure what that is. It might be a cooler for something with a NASCAR, but uh, it doesn't actually say what this is at all in the instructions. Here we also have a brace bar for the roll cage, which is also padded. And then we have this long transmission tunnel cover, and that is just to slick it out for racing because there's only the gear shift that which goes up into this notch here, not all the rest of the detail. And then we have the racing steering wheel with the wrap around the steering wheel edge. There is a lot of flash on here, which you will have to clean up with your hobby knives and files. The backside has some mold marks that you'll have to get rid of. And there is one component I haven't talked about on here just yet. And that is this funny little block with the button or the hole sitting right here. And I do believe this is a carryover from the 1968 kit again. And these are the blocks that were used to raise the front end up for the drag racer. Now there is something special about the headers that we will talk about in a minute once I show the chrome parts tree and it'll all make sense. But just keep this in mind. And the interesting thing is there's only one of these blocks existing in this kit right now. So you would have to buy two of these kits to get a pair of blocks if you want to try to do the dragster. Our next parts tree has a few more curious components that I can't really figure out, as well as just some regular components, of course. These are the curious ones I can't figure out. I'm not sure what these are meant for. They're not included in the instructions, but this is an intake manifold. It's actually a valley cover and something else would have gone in this hole inside the valley cover. That might again be that cross ram intake from the dragster kit. 
Anyway, here we have blank outs for the headlights. We also have a rear wheel this time around. We also have blank outs for the tail lamps. And then right in the center there, I'll just turn this over. That is another blank out panel, but I'm not 100% sure what it goes to. I'll have to look at the instructions for that. If you want to use this strange manifold, you would have to get rid of these mold marks off the bottom. But there's nothing for, you know, for anything with it on the top, so I'm not sure what you'd use it for. I have a new theory on these parts. I do believe that these are left over from that 1971 Modified Stalker Cobra kit. What I think these parts are, are the push bars that went into the front grille and were used in the oval track racing. So that would explain where these are from. These are just, again, a holdover from an earlier edition of the kit. This parts tree contains our plastic axle pins for the front end, our NASCAR dashboard, our stock dashboard, the Cobra Jet hood scoop for the stock version only. We also have our grill screen for the NASCAR and these funny two little bits, which again, I don't know what they're from. It's not in the instructions, but uh, they are interesting nonetheless. Maybe some aerodynamic thing. I'm not sure. I thought I'd just take a second to bring this up into the camera so we can see the nice gauges here on the NASCAR dashboard as well as our gauges and the radio on the stock dashboard. And turning this over, you can see two mold marks on the back of that mesh, which you will have to remove in order to get this to fit flat on the grill. This parts tree contains our stock bucket seats and seat backs, as well as the rear bench seat and one more NASCAR wheel. Now, loose in the box is our stock steering wheel. And here is the hood which is actually on the parts tree. The hood I showed from before was from the 2006 model kit, but it's the same hood. There you can see the nice Ford steering wheel, really looking good. We also have the great upholstery pattern on the seats with the center little uh, logo in the middle. Again, really nice work, really crisp detail. And as I showed before, when you turn it over, this time around on this hood, I've got mold marks. Those will have to be removed. But uh, you do have that nice bracing under the hood and the cutouts for your hood scoops. Here we have the clear plastic components that make up our rear glass as well as the front windshield and the red transparencies, which make up the taillight lenses. There is no distortion in the glass and it is really nice and clean. Here we have our two sets of tires. These are the NASCAR racing tires, and these are the regular factory production tires. So what we have here is the Goodyear Blue Streak NASCAR racing tires. And then over here we have Goodyear Polyglass GTs. Now the slicks, of course, are slicks. They do have a seam line up the center. So with the wheel and tire spinning tool that you have, you will put these tires on there, use your sanding block, just like so as it's spinning, and you'll get rid of that seam line by sandpapering it right off there. Same with the Goodyear Polyglass GTs. They do have this pretty wild tread pattern on here, and I do think that under round two, They've actually re-engineered these tires and made that tread a lot thinner so that it looks a little more to scale. But overall, these are nice classic type of tires and they will look good on your model. Here we have the chrome parts trees. The tree on the top is from the 2002 kit and features the smooth lower panel and bumper from the Fairlane, Cobra and Talladega cars. The tree on the bottom features the upscale Torino rear egg crate grille. This chrome parts tree is included in the 2006 and 2022 editions of this model. So if you have this parts tree, you cannot build an accurate Ford Fairlane Cobra. You can only build the Torino, Torino, Torino 1969. Here is the smooth panel from the 2002 edition as well as the front grille. Now the front grille itself in both kits is actually the base model Fairlane front grille 
And the Cobra actually is different if you take a look at it. Same as the Torino. This is the parts tree from the 2006 and 2022 edition. And you can see the Torino rear egg crate grill right underneath this lower panel. Another thing to note is the chrome plated headers. These are listed in the instructions for use with the NASCAR engine. I've seen a few YouTube build videos where the model builders have tried to use these headers and complained that they are too long and that they drag along the ground. The reason why they do this is because these headers are carryovers from the original 1968 drag racing version and they were meant to be used with the front end riser blocks shown here. So the current AMT instructions show the wrong headers for the NASCAR engine. Use the high flow manifolds from the street racing version on your NASCAR and you should be okay. Now looking at the parts tree up close, we have the awesome chrome plated oil sump which goes on the bottom of the oil pan. And then we have our Thunderbird-esque style air cleaner for the dual carbs. There's the dual carbs right there. We also have this high profile intake manifold sitting there. And then we've got our stock wheels. Now you will need to paint a bit of aluminum inside here. And we also have these open hole custom wheels, a couple of gear shift levers, and then, like I was saying before, the wonderful Ford Fairlane grill with molded in headlights. The nice part with the molded in headlights is they are always aligned perfectly with the lines going north, south, east, and west as they should. And then here we have the Ram Air hood. Uh, this is the air cleaner for that Ram Air hood. And that, of course, would sit on our stock carburetor. Here we have velocity stacks with a mesh molded inside them. So a little bit of a black wash will bring that out nice. Again, really cool looking chrome parts tree. Oh, and then we have the exhaust pipe ends, which apparently are the best exhaust pipe ends in all of model kit history. Now that I'm not too sure of, but I did read it somewhere. There is a mold mark right behind the license plate on the rear bumper, which will have to be removed. There are some here as well, and those could be removed to get that red taillight to sit down nice and flat. And of course, while you're scraping the chrome off, you are also removing it from here which would make a nice glue contact surface area for your model. There are some old marks on the back here as well. Just uh, we'll have to check to see if that has any significance in the body or not, but you might have to remove those as well. There are some sink marks up on the grill. Again, these might be deliberate. We have to see where it's going to fit in the body. If these are stopping points for anything, if not, just remove them. Paint this whole area black so that you won't see it when you flip the car over. Same with the back of the rear bumper up in here. Paint all that black. And again, you should be able to have a nice model at the end of your build. Finally, we have the RC2 decal sheet, which was a carryover from the AMT Ertl decal sheet of the late 1980s. It has these tricolored stripes that run the length of the body and a pair of engine bay decals and a I Love Model Cars bumper sticker and a pair of Texas license plates, 170 DEV. The new decal sheet from round two is much better and includes a choice of black or white stripes and a whole lot more. next week on the Monster Hobbies Model Car Garage. Well, why don't we start with some tools first, actually. And remember, we're only going into where it meets the trunk line. And I'm just gonna make a line across. And now what I'll do is I'll just go and cut those out. So just be careful cutting around the line. 